Hey, Don and Oren, how you doing? Hey, Jordan. Hi, Oren. Great. Good to see you. <laughs> how are you faring during this insanity? A lot of cooking and reading. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and teaching. Yeah. Teaching on Zoom. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah, te Lovely. Teaching yeah. and uh, Findizen keep me safe. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I bow. Wow. I bow. <laughs> Well, anyway, it's, it's, I'm so privileged and honored to have both of you here, two of my mentors and uh, teachers and just legend, legends in the bass world, uh, both playing and teaching. Um, Oren O'Brien, member of the New York Philharmonic since 1966, first woman in the Philharmonic. Uh, Remarkable achievement. Um, actually, I have to interrupt because the first woman was the second harp in the 1930s, <laughs> Steffi Goldner. But ah. the second harp was never a full contract member. You know, they only hired them by the week whenever they needed them for a Ravel or Debussy or whatever, or Wagner. So right. that's why they made a fuss over me is because I was a member of a section and a full right. year round contract member. But she was before me and I always want to give her credit. Oh, that's so, great. You know, and also there was a harpist in the 1950 that lasted for three years, um, a, a woman that eventually went to teach harp in Vienna at the Vienna Conservatory. And oh. eventually after she left the Philharmonic, Meyer Rosen took her place. And Meyer Rosen was there for the first 30 years of, of my time in the Philharmonic. And I got very friendly with him and his brother because they had both studied with Stephanie Goldner in the 1930s during the depression there was philharmonic scholarships for kids that didn't have any money. You know, there were competitions and they, uh, Meyer won and he had two younger brothers that also played harp and they used to come to his lessons with Steffi. And, and Meyer said that Steffi always treated them like they were her children, they were, that she was wonderful to them. So that's how I know about her is because of the, the harpist in the philharmonic told me all about it because they, and it's also a philharmonic connection because Philharmonic used to give scholarships with the principal players or associate players for, you know, during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And I don't know exactly when this was discontinued, but for a long time, a lot of young musicians benefited from that, from that gift from the Philharmonic uh, oh, wow. principles. Yeah. Wow. That's so, Extraordinary. That's neat. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. <laughs> wow. And, and you had, a history in New York as well. Before that, I mean, being you were a member of the American Symphony Orchestra under Stokowski, uh, played in the City Ballet and subbed in the Met. Where you were a sub or in the Met? I was. As well, right? I was an extra bass, the seventh bass for Eric Leinsdorf's Ring Cycle in 1961 to 63. I wow. think I played a total of 16 performances of the extra bass because he wanted more bass, which I really respect, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, the first bass, the principal bass at that time was George Andre, who was a former pupil of Zimmerman's and Reinsagen. And he called me up uh, and asked me if I wanted to play extra, but that I would have to audition for the personnel manager, Felix Eiley, who was former concertmaster of the Met. So I went down there and played a couple of things and I was acceptable. And so I started to work with them. And then when the bass section figured that I, I could play decently, they used to let me sub for other things. So I got calls to come in and play, play Rosen Cavalier with um, Carl Boom without a rehearsal. Wow. And things like the bass section told me, don't even try to play the first note, you'll never get it. Just come in in the second bar because Boom is very difficult to follow. And, you know, I mean, they, they were wonderful because they, they clued me in of all the possibilities of making mistakes. And there were people there like Ernest Gruen and Julie Tiven, who was the son of a famous bass player, Morris Tiven. And uh, it, it just, it was a, an education because they would always tell you things about the operas that you should watch out for or that you didn't know. And it was, it was a, a wonderful experience <clears throat> musically, which I was grateful for um, because how else would have I have gotten that, that experience without the connection with Zimmerman and Reinsagen? I would not have been invited, I don't think. So, right. so, you know, it, connection and history and the kind of training you have all feed into whether or not you have wonderful musical experiences, I think. The yeah, people sure. you know, like you and Don, the people, <laughs> you know, that, 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 that are so important in handing on the traditions of playing and experience and musical perception and, 
and, and sensitivity. I think that all goes together. So, sure. Yeah. And the link that I find so fascinating, I mean, between the three of us, I'm third generation, I mean, basically going back more than that to Samandel, but I mean, that you studied with Ryan Tegan, who was Mahler's assistant principal bass in the Philharmonic. And well, under I'm, both them, he and Toscanini. Unfortunately, I was not smart enough or educated enough to, to ask him the questions that I would be so happy to ask him now. You know, I didn't, I had never heard a Mahler symphony until I came to New York, because as you know, Mahler wasn't popular. When sure. Metropolis was conducting it at the Philharmonic in the 1950s, there used to be an audience of a, a couple hundred people, all with scores under their arms and very Mahler focused, but it never sold out until Bernstein made it popular. So um, one of the things that I was also grateful for was I ushered in Carnegie Hall for two years while I was studying at Juilliard. So I heard 10 performances a week average, four performances of the Philharmonic every week for two whole years. So I got to hear the orchestra under all kinds of different conductors and also notice that they were able to change with each conductor. They responded differently to each conductor, which to me is one of the most fascinating things. Also, it's fascinating to me how Orpheus manages to do all that without a conductor. So okay. this is something that I think that uh, is very precious too. Yeah. So, well, we, we haven't gotten to Mahler yet, but uh, oh. <laughs> who knows? No, wait a minute. Uh, there, no, there's, no. there's an arrangement of the Fourth Symphony for 15 players. Yeah, that's which right. Which I've yeah. always wanted to play because I think that would be more fun to play in a small group where you hear every line clearly. Yeah, I would right. love to play that someday. And we were supposed to play the Das, das Lied this year in the oh, chamber. Oh, really? Version. Chamber. Uh, yeah. that, was, that was that was That's canceled, great, too. To, just to throw in a few little things about why I started bass, since that's more or less what you asked me. Uh, I had 10 years of piano. And when I went to high school, um, I saw the orchestra play at a, an assembly my first month there. And the orchestra was so fantastic. And the concert master, who was a, a woman named Irene Rabinovich, played the Saint-Saint Rondo Capriccioso. And I was just floored. I thought, this is a high school orchestra? And I ran up to the conductor after they played and said, please, can I join? Well, what do you play? I play piano. Oh, we don't need any pianos. Oh, you're tall. We have a need for bass players. You go in that closet and there's a bass and a bow. I'll give you the name of a teacher. If you study for six months, I'll let you in the orchestra. And that's how I started. So I just fell in love with it and fell in love with playing with orchestra and, and all my friends in high school, the only ones I have left, they're all musicians. They're all people we used to hang out together at lunchtime, talk about music. And um, it, it just, and one of them is the head of the cello department at New England Conservatory, Larry Lesser, it's from, from my high school. And uh, so, so that's how I, I started. And my mother wanted to get me out of the house in the summer and she called up the bass teacher at the Music Academy of the West, who was Milton Kestenbaum, who had been a member, he was the first bass of Pittsburgh Symphony under Reiner. Then he went to New York to become a member of the NBC Symphony with Toscanini. He quit there in 1948, went to Los Angeles to be a studio musician and to be able, as he told me, to go fishing and play tennis. He didn't want to work so hard like he did for so many years in New York and Pittsburgh. So luckily enough, my mother took me to audition for him for the Music Academy. And he told me the first thing he said, raise your base a foot, because I had the scroll about here. I didn't know any different. And he's and I said, I can't do, oh, do what I say. All right. So I raised the base. I played something silly. And he said, well, you're not very good, but uh, we'll take you because we only have one bass, other bass player at this academy this summer. So we'll take you. So my mother borrowed money because we didn't have very, very much. She borrowed some money to pay the tuition and I went to the music academy. And at the end of the summer, I begged Mr. Kestenbaum to take me as a student and he agreed. So then I studied with him and he told me at the end of the three years of study that I could go to New York and apply to study with Fred Zimmerman, who he thought was the best teacher in the world. If not, if not the world, at least in America was the best teacher. So. So that's how I ended up in New York, is that my wonderful, helpful teacher in Los Angeles prepared me properly to, to take, take an audition. And of course, in those years, in the 1950s, orchestras didn't pay very much. 
So there weren't as many musicians in the conservatories at the time. In fact, there were only, only two bass players, myself and another fellow, uh, auditioned for Juilliard that year. And they didn't give him a full scholarship, so he went to Manus to study with Phil Sklar, who was the first bass of the NBC Symphony. He really wanted to study with Zimmerman, but he, they didn't give him a full scholarship, so he went to Manus, which was fine. Wow. So, so that's, that's how I ended up in New York. Wow, that's neat. Great story, great story. Don, yes. you are my teacher, <laughs> former teacher. That's right. Um, <laughs> founding member of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Um, played in the LA Phil soon before, I guess it was before Orpheus had formed, correct? Was well, I, I took a year off, <clears throat> one year off, and I went to LA, then I came back. So. That's right, that's right. So Don, uh, for our viewers who don't know, which uh, there are probably maybe two out there, Don uh, has- <laughs> Two viewers or two who don't know? No, two who don't know. <laughs> two who don't know, of course. Don is uh, a wonderful conductor, bassist, uh, professor of bass at the New England Conservatory of Music and the Yale School of Music uh, for many years. And both of you have students all over the place and very successful in that, in that regard. So, Don, you were, um, I have to throw this in, I studied with you um, from 1989 to 93. I think you took a year off, but uh, I, uh, I I remember I auditioned for Manhattan School, and I was supposed to study with Homer, um, and I was all set. He gave me a full scholarship to Manhattan School, and uh, but that summer, my mom, without me knowing this, started doing some some investigating about the teachers uh, at Manhattan School, and she found out through Stephen Gaber, who we're friends with, and, and her brother, David, that you were appointed to the faculty at Manhattan School. And I had already known about Orpheus, and I would already I think I had a few of the recordings and was sort of obsessed even, even at that time. And I switched to you mid-summer before I started with Homer, which um, nothing against Homer, I, but I did I did feel the wrath of, of Homer a little bit for the next four years. But, um, but I do think it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And uh, yeah, I just want to turn it over to you. I would love to hear about your upbringing in Staten Island. Um, you know, what brought you to New York City? I know you didn't play for very long before you got into Juilliard, but I'd love to hear some, some of your thoughts. Sure, sure. Well, just yet yeah, going back to you in Manhattan. I mean, you were, yeah. It was great to start at that school and have such such an amazing student. It made my my first year of That's teaching sweet. really, really uh, pleasurable and easy. Um, and 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 thanks to your mom, you're now a member of Orpheus. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm forever in debt. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, so I grew up on Staten Island. Um, um, uh, I have, my family is along from you know from New York. My grandfather was uh, borough president of Staten Island for twelve years when uh, LaGuardia was mayor, and um, and uh, I was a rock and roll guitar player. And uh, my father uh, worked in a, a a Ford dealership in Brooklyn, and somebody gave him a stack of jazz records, and he brought them home. And uh, among them was a, a Mingus record. And, and my father liked big band jazz and Mingus was too progressive for him. So he gave me all the, all the records that he didn't want. And, and I listened to this, I listened to Mingus. It was, uh, it was a record called Newport Rebels. And I listened, there was a, a, a tune called Mysterious Blues and there's a big bass solo at the end of it. And I just, I fell in love with the sound and with Mingus, and and so I just decided I'm switching to bass. And um, I had I had various uh, teachers. My first teacher was a guitar player who was one lesson ahead of me in the book, <laughs> and pretty soon I passed him. And uh, my second teacher was a tuba player who doubled on bass, 
a guy named Joe Hebert, who was absolutely wonderful. He used to have me play trombone etudes, and, and uh, but a very good musician. Uh, my third teacher was Ron Carter. I really wanted to study with Mingus, but Mingus was kind of, kind of crazy, volatile personality, very hard to pin down. So Ron Carter took me for a while. Uh, but everybody had always told me the name Fred Zimmerman was always floating around New York, that whether you were a jazz player or a classical player, this is the guy you have to study with. Mm -hmm. So I looked him up in the phone book. For those of you out there who don't know what a phone book is, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have these big books with everybody's phone numbers in them. <laughs> I looked him up and for some miracle, he was listed in the Manhattan phone book. And uh, uh, I called him up and he said, oh, I'm really too busy, but come for a half hour and I'll listen to you. Yeah, so that kind of started and he um, really wanted me to go to Juilliard. He didn't think I was, would quite be ready because this was already the end of my junior year of, of high school. So he said, maybe we'll study for a year and then reply a year later. But I, I, uh, I practiced a lot and finally around December, he said, you know, I think we're gonna go for the audition and see what happens. And he loaned me his bass, his beautiful Panormo Italian bass, because I had a, a pretty crappy play, a K plywood. And, uh, and, and to make a, maybe just to throw this in, he asked me to get my father to uh, borrow a station wagon to bring the base from his apartment up to uh, Juilliard, which was up, uptown where Manhattan is now. And my dad couldn't find anybody with a station wagon, but he had a friend who was an undertaker and he, he loaned him a hearse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we pulled up to Fred's, Fred was on, was it 54th Street, Oren? 55th Street. 55th, 55th Street. between 8th and 9th. Right. We pulled 321. up. 321. 321 West 55th. That was it. We pulled up with the, in the hearse, and the crowd gathered to see who <laughs> died. And, <laughs> and we came downstairs and slid the bass in the back and drove up to Juilliard. <laughs> oh, wow. Remarkable. So, and, and then uh, after Fred, Fred passed away at the uh, end of my or the very beginning of my second year at Juilliard. And um, um, I, we all knew about Orin. She was like, you know, she was the star. Uh, not only we knew she was a wonderful player, but she, she was the kind of, uh, the, she, she embodied the Zimmerman tradition. And, um, and we wished that they had hired her at Juilliard, but I guess she was too young or, you know, it wasn't a big enough name at that point. So, uh, so, uh, I did study with uh, Bob Renanda Juilliard, who was a very nice man. And, uh, um, but he allowed me, he had no ego about his students. Uh, he was not possessive and he allowed me to study privately with Oren, which I did during the summers and, and during the year. And uh, just to kind of continue on that whole Zimmerman way of playing, you know, clean playing with good intonation and a beautiful sound. and. And I mean, things we all aspire to, but uh, sure. Um, uh, sure. so that was, uh, that was a, 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 you know, a wonderful thing that I could continue that tradition uh, with Oren. And I remember yeah. my lessons with Oren. I have to say <laughs> one image that always sticks with me is uh, the way you would, you would just kind of, the way you would sit and listen to me, you had this, this look on your face, like you were just going to hear the most wonderful thing was about to happen. And it, it was so inspiring to play for that kind of attention and that kind of, you know, attitude. And, uh, well, that's it, the way Fred was, you know, yeah, yes. that's, I think yeah. now that I look back, that was one of his qualities too. Yes. But I also remember just to interrupt for a second, once I hadn't practiced enough, once my first year with him what something happened or i was ushering or something and he said oh i see you haven't practiced after one bar and he <laughs> said well if you don't mind i will take the bass from you and i will practice and you can watch and i was so humiliated of course that never happened again i, I was surprised that it happened even once but i have to tell you you, that's always a weapon you can use as a teacher. <laughs> just here, I see you haven't practiced, just let me have this hour. <laughs> and you can learn something by watching me. So. Yeah, right, right. 
yeah. the best well, I, way. I remember but. once I, I played, I played uh, an etude and I think there were two notes that were out of tune and he got very upset and he said, you know, okay, I think we have to demote you. We're going to go back. I go way back in the book and start all over again and oh. and come back and play everything perfectly in tune. Oh, how crushing. <laughs> how crushing. Wow. Oh. Wow. That's amazing. I remember uh, uh, my first year with you, Don, you started me on the gratis at Bernassum, book one. First year? First? Well, no, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I think it was the first yeah. book. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, you know, Boy, I mean, it, I spent maybe I three weeks you. on number one, so right, I mean, right, it, right. It, it, at least, but I just remember how difficult it was preparing those every week because they're, you know, they're, they're, you had to practice them in sections. You had to do them like in four line sections and then connect, connect them, but just getting through one of them every week was was so brutal but i'm so <laughs> indebted to you for for making me do that because i'd never i'd really never done etudes like that at all before i got to manhattan and that was i mean it's that it sticks with me you know um i really need to go back and and revisit those you know yeah let's talk about orpheus a little bit since oh, it's yes. Or <laughs> yes so don tell me just tell me about you know <laughs> there you go I signed up for this year's already. I signed up. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the first day, you know, first early days of Orpheus and what, you know, what rehearsals were like, you know, what do you, what do you remember about, you know, the repertoire you did, you know, where you rehearsed, where you played your first concerts, you know, et cetera. Well, we, uh, I, I was, uh, I was approached, I was at a concert of Stefan Volpe's music in, at, up at Columbia. And uh, this cellist named Julian Pfeiffer walked up to me and he said, I'm starting a conductorless chamber orchestra. Would you like to play? I said, well, sure. I was just out of Juilliard. I had a few gigs, but I didn't have a lot to do. So I said, yeah, sure. So uh, so we, uh, we rehearsed. Um, well, there used to be a rehearsal hall in the uh, Ansonia, um, you know, that building in 73rd, 74th Street. Uh, uh, and it was really cheap. Um, and even though we didn't have a lot of money, uh, they used to chase us to get us to pay them after rehearsal. And Julian used to hide behind my base when we'd walk <laughs> out so the lady in the office wouldn't see him. <laughs> And we played in churches. We played down at the Jefferson Market. We played uh, in in a basement at Co-op City. We played on the Staten Island Ferry. I mean, we played anywhere where they would let us pay, play. Wow. And, um, and the group, uh, you know, was all the same kind of young people out of, mostly out of Juilliard and Curtis, who just wanted to play, you know, and and it was nice because we were doing not huge repertoire. I mean, Haydn, C.P., Bach, Mozart, for the most part. Um, but, you know, it was interesting repertoire. And, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. And it was really, really good players. So it was a kind of way of flexing your musical muscles while you're learning how to play well in an, in an ensemble. Um, yeah. And uh, the, once we started to be a little bit more organized and a little larger, um, rehearsals were tough sometimes. They were, you know, there was a lot of arguments. And uh, for a while we rehearsed with the strings facing the winds so we could have this dialogue and which I thought was kind of a good idea. And, um, but there were a lot of fights. There were a lot of votes. <laughs> you, know, you know, you'd vote on. You want to play the phrase that way. You know, and, uh, 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 I have to say, not as bad as the Israeli chamber orchestra. When we were in Tel Aviv with Orpheus once, I went to one of their rehearsals, and they were doing a conductorless thing. And they, they literally argued for the entire rehearsal. I didn't hear a note of music. And then they packed up and left. <laughs> so we were, a little, we were a little better than that, you know? <laughs> I have to say, or, we're just sticking one thing. 
uh, when Meta was our music director, he used to accuse us of being the second worst orchestra for talking during rehearsals. First was Israel. That <laughs> okay. they were even worse than we were, he complained. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yes. We, we considered that a badge of honor, of course. Of course. Of course. Right. Sure, yeah. We were mad we were second. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. But, you know, it was, it was a nice, and uh, for me, uh, always, uh, um, e even the very beginnings, just uh, my favorite thing, and to this day, is playing Mozart piano concertos. Oh. And, and um, so in the very beginning, um, you know, uh, I think uh, Emmanuel X appeared with us, and we used to do our concerts in Tully Hall, because it was a smaller hall, and it kind of suited our audience. Um, and uh, Peter Serkin, uh, may he rest in peace. I love Peter, a wonderful person mm -hmm. and musician. And uh, yeah. he was one of our earliest soloists. And I learned a lot by watching him during those rehearsals. He was uh, really quite amazing. And of course, all the wonderful pianists that followed afterwards. Richard Good was an early oh, one who's, who's who, Richard Good. you know, wow. just the, the wow. ultimate Mozart player. And uh, mm -hmm. these days, the ultra player in anything, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, and Brendel and Radu Lupu and Alicia De La Rocha and, and just so many amazing artists, uh, many of whom Jordan and I recorded with Richard. We did those Mozart concerti with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, one of our first first two recordings were the Mozart, the ballet music from Idomeneo and the, uh, and the wind concertante. And then the second recording was two concertos with, uh, with Richard Good, the A major and the G major. So, uh, yeah, so. But that was on Nonesuch, or no, wait, what was yes, that label? Nonesuch, yes, it Nonesuch. Was, yeah, okay. yeah, Nonesuch. That's yeah. right. And I, I have, have nearly, nearly all the Orpheus CDs. I, there's a few I don't have, but I have most of them. Wow. So especially the ones with bass solos. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, sure. and, and I, the reason I buy tickets, even though some of them are the nights that I can't go because I'm working, I buy them for my students because I tell my students, you go to Orpheus and you watch everything that those musicians do, particularly the bass players, because that's the way you have to play. That's the way I'm hopefully training you to play exactly like that. That's your ideal. So that's yeah. why I, another reason I love Orpheus is because it stands as the example of how to play perfectly. And if there's a conductor, you can, you, you know, you're helping the conductor by playing this way. He doesn't have to say anything to the bass section. If you play this way, they will never have anything to say with to the bass section. Yeah. Uh, so. You're here. Well, yes. I, that, that is, that's something that's always impressed me about you, Orrin, is I, all the years I've known you, I've, I can't believe I've known both of you for 30 years now, but. Um, you're not but, that old, Jordan. You're I know. Not you're I only 20. 50, I know, Whoa. it's crazy. But uh, no, that always impressed me that, I mean, as long as I can remember, you bought blocks of tickets for students and you just saw the importance of, of yes. what Orpheus can be in, in the training of musicians. And, and I was one of them. I'm sure you probably provided me in some way with a ticket to Orpheus through some channel, but I, I, I would go to, you know, for four or more years before our, I even played with the group, I was going to every concert I could. Um, I lived in Spain for a year. I got to hear them when Ooh. they came there. And Ooh. that was, uh, oh. but, but going to, like you say, to Orpheus concerts is a real education. And, um, you know, not only just visually, how are they doing this? And, um, but what you bring away from the actual experience in playing in Orpheus, which I'm sure Don could speak to much better than I, but one thing I take away from, and I've always taken away from Orpheus is the, just it, it it spoils you for playing in conducted performances because you <laughs> you're you're just so forced to immerse yourself in the music in the score and you know I would be obsessed before I did my first rehearsals with Orpheus which were terrifying you know I would I'd spend days just listening just looking at the bass part with the recording not not a score or looking at a you know there were no videos of it then but uh it was just just orally getting it in your ears and 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 imagining that there was a conductor and or conducting along with it yourself and 
and of course when you're in in the actual experience of playing in Orpheus um, you know your ears are just I think so much more in tune than in sometimes a traditional orchestral environment I'm not saying that that's the way it is in orchestras all the great orchestras are trained to be listening to and, listen it's the most yeah and thing. yeah and then like you know George Sell said to play like a quartet and and be and orchestra you know, playing is giant chamber music he used to say a few times right. that we work with him but I just have yeah. to tell you one Orpheus experience that we had in the Philharmonic the only one that I can think of is when Bernstein died I think it was 1990 I think that was the year that he died um mm -hmm. the orchestra was trying to think of some way to honor him and Mazur was our music director he had just become our music director then and we decided that we would like to play the Candide Overture without a conductor as an encore. So we started doing that during the 1990s, during the time that Mazur was our music director. Even when we went on tour, Mazur would leave the stage and Glenn Dictrow would go and we'd start and we'd play it. And we had such fun playing it that way. And it was perfect. Nothing ever went wrong. Every The, the feeling of the orchestra, the, the spirit of Bernstein was maybe hovering nearby. And yeah. we, we enjoyed that so much. The next sure. music director, I will not mention his name, <laughs> did away with that and started teaching us how to play it. <laughs> and the orchestra went into a deep depression <laughs> because we were deprived of the Orpheus experience. So I yeah. just wanted to mention that one little thing. For for about 10 years there, we every year and on tour, we did this as an encore. And there was a feeling of freedom and joy there that that was rarely attained in other ways. Yeah. yeah. But also, yeah. But I think what you said is that um, it does, it helps you grow because you just, you start to really study, um, you know, get involved with the score and you just start to hear everything and think about everything. And uh, um, although I have to say, um, uh, uh, when I studied with Oren, uh, it, it was a very, a very immersive. It wasn't just, here's the bass, play those notes, that's okay, see you next week. You know, it was all about the music and the score and listening to different recordings and and all of that stuff. And uh, yeah. um, so, uh, and there are, you know, there's there's a kind of uh, w many wonderful musicians, but kind of different classes of musicians. Some that are more more jocks or athletes, and some that are you know, going maybe a little deeper down into you know what this art is really about. And uh, yeah. and I have to say, Oren as a teacher really nurtured that. And and I say, uh, you as a student, you know, were really you know you were just in the middle of it, and you've always been. You've always impressed me with your incredible knowledge of repertoire and recordings and 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 um, and. Yeah you know, interpretations and things like that. And that's what makes the art interesting, you know, not putting your third finger down on an A flat, you know. Right, right. So, so true. <laughs> Although that's hard. <laughs> well, I meant a high A flat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, do you, do you find, I just want to ask both of you, do you find today that your students don't listen enough to the entire work when they're studying something. I find that I have to pound away on that. And now, of course, that we're online a lot of the time, it's hard to get people to, to focus that way. Although I have to say, Don, somebody that you're going to teach this year, Zachary, Zachary is very good at, uh, at listening, and he's very conscientious about that. So I yeah. think that he will be a, a very uh, interesting person to teach. Well, I think with, with their, you know, all their apps on their iPhones, it's very easy for them to listen to anything, you know, on demand, anywhere they are. Uh, but, but they also tend maybe not to have the full experience. So yes. you, you listen to those 20 bars of the excerpt, but you don't really have a sense of context. So I think right. it's is to get them to really, you know, get a whole sense of the whole thing and the style rather than... The style. Uh, yeah. Just, just dialing up those 20 bars to see what the tempo is, you know. Right. Well, there's also so little information for them, you know, on YouTube or on Apple or if you buy, if you download something, there's there's no information even saying who the 
the orchestra is or the conductor right. or what year right. it was. And, you know, I mean, I was fortunate to come up in that CD LP era where, you know, I would go down to Tower and HMV and, and uh, at Lincoln Center and I'd spend hours in there, come home where I'd sit on the train. I couldn't wait to get home. I'd already be opening up CDs and reading liner notes. And, you know, you go home and you read the liner notes. You find out when it was recorded, where it was recorded, who was in the band. Um, you know, I, I've been struck over the years teaching students and not, not all of them, but so many of them don't, uh, you know, I'll say, uh, so we're working on Beethoven 7 this week. Uh, what, what recordings have you listened to? And they say, um, I have one. Well, do you know who it is? Um, no. I mean, they don't know who the orchestra is or the conductor. Now, uh, this, this to me is crazy because I, I guess I just was uber obsessed with with it you know the That's history of it be. you should right. be obsessed you know what may, the best it, only go for the best right don't listen to may, the lower slobovian symphony with mr <laughs> Hoopsie, you know well, sometimes those are good though you'd be surprised those, <laughs> oh, those che well, czech slovak radio yonel perlega yonel perlega who used to be the conductor at manhattan school in the 1950s has a lot of good recordings Oh, sure. Yeah, wow. he was a Romanian conductor, I I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe it was it was just a connection to having my grandfather, who had all this history in the Cleveland Orchestra. I guess I always had a an interest in the history of the Cleveland Orchestra, and you know, just the the number of composers and I mean, you know, the people he met, you know, from from Stravinsky to Ravel, and and it's pretty remarkable. So I maybe that sparked my obsession with it, but. But, you know, I would love to see more of it, people. I would also love to see record companies being more responsible in what they put out there, you know, list musicians, list all of the information that goes with it, you know, because it's, uh, we're losing so much history and so much, you know, so much else. Yeah, I agree. So Jordan, I have a, I have a, a question for you. I know I have my, my favorite Orpheus experiences. Do you have any concerts or things that stick out in your years with the orchestra that just kind of you remember them being very special events? Hmm. A few. I mean, I, I wish I had thought about this more before we got on on this chat, but um, a few that pop up um, were certainly one of the early tours I did with you to South America, Don, uh, with Radu Lupu. Oh. Ding, doing uh, Beethoven's oh. fourth piano concerto. Oh, Radu Lupu. Playing, oh, playing in the Teatro Cologne in Buenos Aires. Yes. And um, I mean, uh, another concert that you know was a tour to Europe when we were in a, a small, maybe it was Locarno, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Swiss or the, the Swiss, Ita Swiss, Swiss Italian border. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was with uh, Alicia de la Rocha doing Mozart piano concertos in it. An old church that I'm sure you remember. Just, there's so many uh, that I, you know, I, I wish I could recall right now, but yeah, I'm, yeah. I'd love to hear what some of your yeah, experiences. Yeah. Well, no, I was just curious, because yeah, those, I, that, that's, that's true that, that, that I remember Cologne, Teatro Cologne was a wonderful, I mean, it's a great hall and uh, it's like a, it's like the Stradivari of, of concert halls. It's just an amazing, amazing place with those old thick boards, old thick boards that you could dig your end pin in and make this incredible sound. You know, oh, yeah. There wasn't someone out putting a rock stop or a slat for you to put your... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's like the Musikverein. I mean, I, this concert behind oh. me was one of the great concerts I'll never forget with Anna Sophie von Otter. And, uh, you know, one of the, I only played in the Musikverein four times, but I mean, each one of them is, is you were, you'll never forget really, you know, yeah. I'm sure you, have, you know, have those experiences yourself, but. Uh, I think. Oh yeah, should. no, those are, that was one of my, one that I remember and it, I, it might've been just a very personal reflection, but was playing the Brahms, the, the small serenade, the second serenade, the one without violins in, in the Musikverein. Oh. And 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 uh, I don't know. Maybe Brahms' spirit was still hovering around or something. But just I mean, I remember the first time we played there. I was so intimidated. I just felt like 
I don't belong here. I was, I, I, it was not a good concert for me the first time. I just felt, I felt the weight of history and I just didn't feel like I was worthy of being in that room. Oh. And, oh. and, but, but the next time we did the Brahms, the serenade, because some of the violins used to carry violas, they hated it, but they used to bring, because <laughs> Orpheus travels without instrument trunks, unlike the New York Philharmonic. So you have to carry your instrument wherever you go. <laughs> so the violins- I, I, I've done tours like that. The ballet used to tour by bus, <laughs> right. west, I remember. Yeah. So the violins would have double cases and, uh, and uh, so we would usually have maybe eight violas and four cellos and one or two basses. And I just remember mm -hmm. particularly almost revelatory kind of performance in the Musique for Ryan of that piece, which is a piece I've always, one of my favorite Brahms pieces. Yeah. And uh, it was really a great, uh, yeah, but there, is, there are so many, there are so many that, uh, yeah. I Remarkable. think the Schoenberg, the, the first camera symphony, when we first did it in Carnegie Hall, we had played, um, I forget what year it was, but we had played four nights in a row right before Carnegie. And then we went into Carnegie and we were, we were really ready. We were hot. And it's not a big piece, it's 15 players. So you just, you're right in the middle of the stage. And uh, I have... It, I have to tell a story which you probably wouldn't tell because it's complimentary to, your, to yourself and your group. But I took my students to your performance of the Schoenberg with Robert Kraft conducting at, I think it was at Merkin or, yeah. 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 And at the end of the performance, a Kraft turned around and told the audience, they know this piece better than I do. <laughs> now this was Stravinsky's secretary talking, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, Schoenberg, uh, later Stravinsky's secretary. So I thought that was the greatest compliment you could possibly have outside of the fact that you, you all know how well you knew it. Yes. You know, you didn't need him to tell you, but I, I, thought, I, I thought my students were, were blown over by that. And that's how you should feel when you perform something, you should feel that you own it. Zimmerman used to use the expression, you have to own a piece before you can really play it well. You have to own it. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I have to say, I remember it Kraft. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of Orpheus people in that in that performance, and we actually did a recording of it later. And uh, I have it. I have it. <laughs> and and um, yeah, and he was you know so we 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 did we did know the piece better than he did. So we had a lot of little things we we wanted we needed to rehearse, which he wasn't rehearsing, you know. But I liked him. I, he was a very generous person, and. Um, um, and I'm, I'm glad he acknowledged that and I found him, you know, to be easy to work with. I think he was a little frustrated in the beginning because everybody was just taking over the rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> like we do oh, in not? Orpheus. We, it, was just, it was just Orpheus, but there was this guy standing up there. <laughs> but, uh, no. but after we played it, uh, uh, Eugene Lehner, who was the violist in the Kolish Quartet came backstage. He was in the audience and he, he came up to a few of us. He said, I played this with Schoenberg in Vienna. And I, my, I just got, you know, like the goosebumps, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, he had, you know, he had premiered uh, Schoenberg's uh, second and third quartets. He had premiered the Lyric Suite. He had played the Camera Symphony with Schoenberg, you know. And uh, it was it was great to have that that connection and wonderful that he could be there. He later came to the states, was in the Juilliard Quartet very briefly, and then spent the rest of his time in the Boston Symphony. And Larry Lesser did hire him to coach at NEC. Oh, so Larry Lesser was great. He hired Lehner to coach, and he hired Louis Krasner, the guy, the violinist who, who commissioned the Premier Baird. They were two of the coaches that were really connected to that that uh, second east Vien second viennese school tradition you know larry larry lesser recorded the schoenberg mon concerto which is rarely play played it's a very difficult cello concerto based on themes of mon who was a i think an 18th century composer and uh and larry recorded it with Kraft in la i think years ago before he came to uh to boston but that's a pretty brave thing to play yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh. No, that Warren, tell us, uh, Jordan had mentioned earlier about the, the genus Thera. So I think for the bass players watching, oh. uh, uh, 
uh, it would be wonderful to hear about your your uh, premiere of the of the the variaciones. Well, you 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 know what a character Stokowski was. He was forming his orchestra, the American Symphony, uh, in I think it was 1960 or 61 that he began auditioning people for it. And I heard that he ultimately auditioned over 600 people for, for the orchestra personally. I think he enjoyed auditioning, showing, showing how much he knew about each instrument. So um, I got a call from his contractor uh, and he said, the maestro would like you to audition for him. And I was about ready in a few days to go to Rome to visit my mother who had moved to Rome. And I, I was also had just moved to a new apartment and I was scrubbing floors. I hadn't practiced that much because I was going to leave. And I said, well, I I've already played with Stokowski. I played two complete double bills with him at City Center Opera in 1959. I played Orpheus uh, Oedipus Rex, Carmina Bur Burana, and the other program was um, the Il Prigionere by Dalla Piccola. And the first piece on the program was Monteverdi's Orfeo with Gerard Suzet as Orfeo. I said, certainly I played, and that was a two bass job at that point for those two small uh, pieces. So I think he would know me. Oh no, he's auditioning everybody. You have to audition for him. And I thought, well, it's a freelance job. Okay, so I'll try. So I called him up and he gave me a long song and dance about, oh, hmm, your name is O'Brien. Ah, are you a queen? Because the O'Briens were supposedly kings of Ireland you know, a thousand years ago. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. And he said, well, do you have a crown? This is all on the phone for an appointment for an audition. And I said, no. He said, well, then you're not a queen. Said, okay. All right. So can I come over tomorrow? All right. And his audition was, I don't know, Don, if you ever played for him in his apartment. Did, I did. you play in that apartment? It was I did on the top floor of a Fifth Avenue building that overlooked the re reservoir of Central Park. It was a very beautiful, you know, and he was sitting down on a chair in front of the elevator when you came out the elevator opened into each apartment and he was sitting in front dressed in a blue silk shirt and blue uh trousers he had recently been conducting at the met he had broken a hip and he was conducting on crutches at the met things like turn and stuff so he was recovering and he was you know dressed in this beautiful way and he took me into the studio and he, he had me play whatever solo I was playing. And then he said, all right, he opened a book that was all handwritten excerpts, which I'm sure you remember, Don. It was all handwritten of various excerpts, but with no composer's name and no instrument name on it. And he opened it up and he said, do you know what this is? I want you to play this. I said, yeah, it's the cello part to the slow movement of Beethoven's fifth. He said, all right, play it. So I did. And then he opened to Mozart 39 and I played that. And uh, at one point a note didn't speak. And he said, why do you think that happened? Why do you think that note didn't sound? I said, well, I don't think I have enough rosin on my boat. He said, no, no, no. He said, your left hand was not holding the string down firmly enough. We must dig down deep for the gold that is in the sound. <laughs> so, okay, all right. And he said, you will be contacted. So. A few, few weeks later, the contractor said, okay, Maestro wants you to be in the orchestra. So I was hired in the section to be either second or third. I think Jesse Tycho was second base and Stuart Sankey was principal. So there were eight of us in the base section and uh, the second or third concert of the year included the genus there variations along with Beethoven third and a couple of other pieces, a harpsichord concerto by Frank Martin and uh, some other, it was a very long and, and challenging program. And I got a call a week before the first rehearsal. He used to have four rehearsals for one, for two concerts. And um, the contractor said, the first bass is ill or can't do the performance. And Maestro would like you to play the solo in the Genestera. So nobody had ever heard of it because this was only, I think the second or third year after it had been written and uh, it hadn't been played in New York or uh, maybe even in America before. America, yeah. So I ran to Patelson's music store and bought the score and ran back. And so then I asked, I said, um, well, how much overscale did it pay? Because I thought that was the professional thing to ask. And he said, it, it pays $10 extra for that week's employment. <laughs> and the maestro was paying it out of his own pocket. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I felt that was a professional question to ask, you know, so 
So I worked on it for a few days and there was no recording of it. So you couldn't have that as a clue. So I figured it out and I figured out some things. And the first rehearsal, I played it and I missed the high E at the end. I played, you know, I went up and stopped, stopped at the wrong stop. <laughs> I got off on the wrong subway stop. And Tchaikovsky looked at me over his glasses and said, practice. And I said, yes, I will, I will. <laughs> and the next day it went okay. And the performances were, were fine. The performances were very enjoyable because actually at that time, uh, the personnel manager had hired some other freelancers that were well known. It wasn't always the same people in the orchestra, but it was generally the same principles, but they were different people. And he, he had hired Ted Flowerman, who was the first bass of, of the New York City Ballet that I was used to playing with for years. And I asked the personnel manager, could you please put him on the first stand with me? And it was like having a comfort thing with you, you know, a comfortable person that knew that you would, he would help you in every possible way. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. And by the way, he did have me, when I auditioned for, for Stokowski, he did have me play the cello theme from the- uh, Beethoven Fifth? Beethoven Fifth. Really? Yeah. Yes. That was his standard <laughs> bass audition. Yeah, he, I think he wanted to see, A, if you could read, and B, if you knew anything- If you actually knew the repertoire. Yeah. Um, oh, but what, what I loved was the book was handwritten with no titles, no information. I kind of loved that. Because <laughs> you know? he really cared about auditioning, and he was a—he it was one of the most pleasant auditions I ever had. Yes, really. And also, I remember when I joined the Philharmonic, one of the oldest violinists was a guy named Louis Fishsong, and he told me a story. He auditioned for Philadelphia for Stokey in the 1920s. He said Stokey put him in a room and said, "Warm up for 10 minutes. I'm going out. I'll come back in 10 minutes. Just be comfortable." So Louis warmed up for 10 minutes alone in the room and played everything, played his solo, played excerpts, whatever, Heldenleben, Mozart, 35, whatever. And 10 minutes later, Stokowski opened the door and said, you have the job. He had listened to him outside the door. <laughs> and he was comfortable and relaxed. So I just thought that was a great story too. So. <laughs> Yeah. Boy, I wish I lived during those days of, of oh. auditions. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Now it's like, can you play every piece written for the double bass? Yes. Yeah. Exactly yeah. the same way that everybody else plays it. <laughs> I know exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> Listen, I have a question for you, too. Um, this is a bass nerd question. but Bass nerd? One thing I've always been curious about, when when did wheels first become popular? 1960. And, 1960. I have okay. a little one from Paul no Piazzi's shop. A little one. Wow. Yeah. I swear I saw a picture of Bill Crow on a on a on a Louis Armstrong tour. I think it was in the late fifties. He was in Russia and he had a wheel on his base. It was like either fifty eight or fifty nine, but I've always been curious, like, when did you start seeing them? And also, when did you stop seeing gut strings? Um, ah, and... I, have, I have the answer to that. Okay. Because, of course, everybody was playing gut strings. When I came to New York, I was playing gut strings. And uh, when we started rehearsing the Gunther Schuller Quartet with Gunther in 1959, we rehearsed Sunday mornings because that's the only time all four of us were free, it was Bob Gladstone, Fred Zimmerman, Alvin Brim and me. And Alvin and Bob already had steel in 1959. They had changed a couple of years before. I don't know why. And I don't think I even noticed it at the time. But um, I remember when Bob won the Philharmonic audition in 1956, he was already also playing steel. And he won the audition. I think he was the only player in that audition that had played steel. And he, it sounded clean. And, you know, it was, as you know, much easier to have clean intonation and a clean sound on every note you play. Gut was like 10 times as difficult. But when we got to the day before the recording, uh, Gunther turned to Fred and me and said, you know, your strings don't hold the harmonic pitches as well as Alvin and Bob's. Would you mind switching to steel for the recording tomorrow? And we looked at each other and said, oh, okay. So we went out and got steel strings and put them on, not realizing that you needed to change the bridge height and the nut height, and it was a different bowing technique. We didn't, we didn't realize because we were, we were adventurous and we wanted to please Gunther and make the thing work. 
So the next day we had a three hour recording session in July when it was hot and sticky, even though I guess there was air conditioning, but it certainly felt pressured to us to be playing. And Fred and I were dying because the strings were this high off the fingerboard. And you felt like your fingers were going to be bloody at the end of the first hour. And I don't know how we did it, but we lasted three hours. Then um, I, of course, went home immediately, ripped off the steel strings and put my gut strings back on because it was something familiar to me. And I just didn't, it didn't feel comfortable and we didn't know. And after a couple of weeks, I found out, number one, I couldn't play spiccato on steel, on, on steel strings. So that's why I enjoyed the gut strings. Then at the ballet, Dave Walter and Ted Flowerman changed to steel, and I was the youngest one and only still playing gut. And the two of them teased me. They said, what's the matter? You're the youngest one. You should change. You should change. So finally, I put on steel strings, and with the right adjustment, they told me you have to adjust the bridge and everything. That was also, by the way, before there were bridge adjusters. Bridge adjusters came in around the same time, but I didn't have any. So... Anyway, uh, I called up Fred in desperation because I used to check with them whenever I had to play something or I had a question about teaching or something. I used to check and I, I, I said to him, I can't spiccato anymore. I don't know what to do. My, my favorite thing to do and now I can't do it anymore. He said, first of all, play closer to the string. With steel strings, you have to use a slower bow and more weight and you also have to not let spiccato go too high. Play closer to the string, you'll find it'll work. Call me up if you have any problem. So I went back and he was of course right. And I found that was interesting because when students came to me later after I started teaching and they started to tell me that their teacher told them to use more bow, I found that the older teachers that didn't make the switch of the difference between gut and steel also used to tell their students use more bow. And that turned out to be wrong, especially for steel less bow was one of one of the clues that you could use less bow you could sustain legato just like a cello or a violin if you knew the right bow technique with steel strings with gut you have to make a faster lighter stroke or the string would balk or make an ugly sound so that that was a, a big moment for bass players in new york uh was was 1960 61 we played uh, the quartet in public about a year after we'd recorded it for Gunther. And then of course we all had steel and we're, we were used to it by then, but uh, it was a big change. For a good player on gut, it was already easier to play on steel once you realize the two main differences. So oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, great. that's the answer. And wheels, <laughs> wheels, all I can say is I got my wheel in 1960. Before that I was lugging it around. <laughs> and it didn't, it doesn't make a difference on stairs, does it? Yeah. <laughs> But they were the the early wheels were terrible. They were terrible. Just, I just still have one. And it, it was just a little metal circle. That's all. I was always getting the lower bouts fixed because yes. the, the block was always you know cracking. Oh bouncing around the sidewalks of New York, yeah. right? Which were never even. <laughs> <laughs> when was the oh, wheel man. invented? That's that's yeah. a, that's the name of this chapter. When yeah. was the that's wheel invented? Right. <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> right. Oh, that's wonderful. Wow. <laughs> well, I, wow. Think, I think it looks like Zach said we're going to get cut off. So maybe, oh, okay. maybe we should leave before we're we cut off. We should leave before we wear out our welcome. <laughs> <laughs> before, the, before the hook comes out. You know? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Jordan oh, and Don, it's been such a pleasure talking with and, you. I tell you, it's always. I wish we could do this every week. Uh, we <laughs> can. <laughs> we could. We could. Oh, thank you both so much. A lot Bye. of fun. A lot Pleasure. of fun. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, right. Lauren. Thanks, Jordan.